1982, an unknown man with no previous Cup Series experience who went by the name L.W. Wright made his way onto the grid at Talladega Super Speedway. He completed only 13 laps before he was black flagged for being too far off the pace. L.W. Wright quietly disappeared after the event and was neither seen nor heard from for nearly 40 years. That all changed in 2021 when reporter Rick Houston, co-host of the Scene Vault podcast, managed to track down the elusive and reclusive L.W. Wright and sit down with him for multiple on-the-record interviews. If you haven't read the two-part story that Rick released on thescenevault.com, I encourage you to do so. Some of the actual stories are harder to wrap your head around than the legend we already knew. There's a car chase, at least four different aliases, private detectives, and the FBI. L.W. Wright managed to get country music legends like Merle Haggard and Waylon Jennings to help fund his Talladega effort. He bought a car from Sterling Marlin, but allegedly never paid for it in full. He got advice from Dale Earnhardt, he got parts and pieces from Bobby Allison and Richard Petty. But did you know, he also attempted to qualify for the next week's race at Nashville. And he also says that he came back into NASCAR years later and actually worked on Buddy Baker's team. Now, more than 40 years after his Talladega escapade, Larry Wright, the man NASCAR fans know as L.W., has been arrested in Knox County, Tennessee on charges of theft, burglary, worthless checks, and evading arrest. The legend of L.W. Wright has always been a fascinating story, but now with more evidence and more details than ever, the story has gained new life. I got to sit down with Rick Houston and Steve Wade of the Scene Vault podcast this past week and asked them about their experience with L.W. Larry Wright the past couple of years. What was it like hearing his stories firsthand? What other discoveries have they maybe made? And what do they believe is next for one of NASCAR's most infamous characters? Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Wade. And my name is Rick Houston. And uh, I'm Eric Eastep from Out of the Groove. And this is a special episode of the Scene Vault podcast in collaboration with Out of the Groove. Uh, gentlemen, I feel almost out of place because you guys have been covering this incredible story for uh, at least a year now, right, Rick? Uh, since you first got introduced to the man NASCAR fans know as L.W. Wright. Well, actually, I've been chasing the story for about two years. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, well, this is like I, like I was saying earlier, this is a crazy, crazy journey. Uh, you know, I don't even know how to put it. I don't even know how to describe it fully. It, it's incredible. I, I've just been reading along. I listened to the first episode you guys did uh, eight or nine months ago last year. Uh, fans have been following along, I think, waiting uh, on the edge of their seat for new updates. And uh, Rick, it sounds like we've gotten some new updates in the past week or so. So what is the big news this week? Uh, the breaking news around L.W. Wright. Well, the the breaking news and, and the latest update on everything that's happened is that Larry Wright, L.W. Wright, is in jail right now. Uh, he was picked up in Knox County for theft over $2,500, burglary, evading arrest, and worthless checks. And that was for charges in uh, Jefferson County. Tennessee, which is just right next to Knox County. Wow. Uh, and <laughs> I guess for my viewers, at least, because this is going out both uh, as a podcast, of course, under the Scene Vault podcast, but it's also being shared on YouTube. Your audience obviously knows the full story, I think, at this point of L.W. Wright. And I think many of my viewers do as well. But I guess to kind of jump off here, can you kind of sort of give us like a, it's hard to make it brief, I know, but a brief explanation as to what makes L.W. Wright's story so fascinating well lw wright's story is fascinating because steve wade was there and actually covered the race that he ran in on may 2nd 1982 in talladega <laughs> yeah, but I, I must go i we were there uh, uh, to cover the race at sin yes i was there but let me explain we didn't take a second look at lw wright because back in those days the races at Daytona and Talladega usually had more entries than they could handle. That's because a lot of drivers that didn't do much racing 
always won the race in those two races. There was four races, by the way. So L.W. Wright was one of them. We just tossed it off. You know, the, when we got there and looked at the entry list, this guy will not qualify. We never heard of him. And so let's just move on. Didn't pay him a single mind of attention while we were there. And though he started the race, as Rick will tell you, he didn't last long. And we had no surprise about that. Had no idea what he really was and what he was really up to. And much less the fact that his so-called legend would last this long. Well, Eric, I'll, I'll just expand on that and say this. Um, <laughs> if drivers, if people in NASCAR who had left behind unpaid bills uh, became, le- if they all became legends, uh, it, it would be enough to fill several stadiums. <laughs> it would be enough to fill several racetracks. But I think what made LW different was the fact or the the story that arose was that he made off with more than $44,000 of equipment and cash uh, and, and then disappeared. Wow. Now, that's the story. But I, I think in this case, truth is truly stranger than fiction. And, yes, he stayed underground. He stayed unseen for more than 40. He stayed unseen for almost exactly 40 years. We actually posted our podcast interview with him on the 40th anniversary of that race. So the, the, the legend is that he vanished into thin air with all this loot and became NASCAR's version of DB Cooper. And again, as readers began to find out in the first part of our, in the first part of the story that I posted on our website, the same um, there truth really is stranger than fiction. And the second part of that story will go up. Hopefully as soon as I get through with this interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will reading the first half, I guess, uh, I, I'm now looking forward to part two, as soon as we wrap this up, but, uh, it, it sounds, I mean, you kind of detailed the start of your relationship, how you first got connected with the man we now know as LW, right? Can you go a little more in detail into how you got in contact with, I guess, first you think you said it was his son and then yes. eventually you were able to meet the man himself. Well, the, the son and I formed a relationship, Chris and I formed a relationship, uh, via text and direct message. And we went back and forth. I'm, I'm honestly not exaggerating through hundreds of messages, you know, how you doing? What's the latest? Uh, is, is there any way that we can get this deal done? Can I talk to Larry? Uh, can I talk to your dad? And from, from the very beginning, his biggest concern always seemed to be getting caught or getting, getting his identity found out and then dying in jail. That was from day one, a a resounding theme of his reluctance to sit down and talk. And we got in touch, Chris and I got in touch and then it was another, it was almost a year before I actually sat down with LW. What happened a little bit before that, Eric? Uh, Rick was always, always obsessed with LW Wright. I mean, he told me repeatedly how he'd love to find that guy and talk to him. Well, I thought Rick was crazy because I didn't think he would ever find LW Wright. If nobody found him for 40 years, what makes you think you could find him now? (laughs) <laughs> and then he told me excitedly one day that he'd been in touch with his son. But that didn't really lead directly to what Rick wanted. It took him another, gosh, I'd say well over a year to get established with LW because the son kept saying LW doesn't feel well today or LW this or LW that. And uh, that, to me, led, led to the fact that LW was really hesitant about doing this because of obviously what Rick said of being caught and perhaps going to jail, but it overcame that. Right, Rick? Well, Eric, it's actually kind of funny because when I would go to Steve with, with the latest update on LW and Larry Wright and Chris and whatever, um, I I worked with Steve day in and day out for nine years. And I, I know that look 
that he has when he's like, what in, you know, what in the world is Houston talking about now? He is, he is chasing this rabbit. And, you know, I got used to that eye roll. Steve Wade has a very distinct eye roll. And even during this process of, of trying to catch up with, uh, LW, I, I saw that eye roll more than once. <laughs> and yeah, he was like, you know, okay. Yeah. You're, you're almost ready to interview him. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've heard that before Hoss. And, you know, we would get close and then it wouldn't happen. We would get close and then it wouldn't happen. We would get close and then it wouldn't happen. But ultimately the, the tide turned for me at least when I met Chris in a parking lot of a Wendy's fast food restaurant <laughs> and he, he actually gave me the uniform that LW Wright wore that day in Talladega. And it, you know, I don't want to over dramatize it or anything, but for me personally, that was kind of the, the Indiana Jones moment. Uh, that was, that was the Holy grail when I saw that thing, because it matches the only known photograph of LW Wright perfectly, perfectly. And so I got back in the car. I didn't, I actually didn't want to take it because I didn't want to take responsibility for it. Uh, I, I consider that a, a pretty valuable artifact, yeah. but Chris wanted me to have it in order to prove that his story, his dad's story was true. And for me, it was the smoking gun. It was the, the, the one thing that truly proved that everything they said was true. At least when it came to Talladega. <laughs> well, I guess on that note, uh, because yes, the photo of the uh, the fire suit uh, was uh, you had that in that article that you posted uh, on the scenevault dot com. Um, but besides Talladega, you know, you mentioned that in a couple times you sat down with Larry Wright. His story changed a little bit. He uh, attempted maybe to qualify for earlier races. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. Uh, can you go into detail a little bit? Like, how difficult, firstly, was it to kind of discern exactly what was the truth versus what was maybe him just kind of saying whatever. And did he race before Talladega? He did race on Virginia short tracks. Uh, I, I think that that much is pretty easy to confirm. Uh, he was on the front of a um, publication that was put out by one of the local short tracks as being one of the late model racers at that racetrack. Um and, you know, I've got multiple pictures of him in various, you know, old, uh, late model race cars. So, you know, that much was easy to confirm. And, and to be honest with you, he, he said that he raced under the name Larry Wright. And so you do a search on race and reference and there's no Larry Wright, hmm. or at least not that Larry Wright. He, he said that he raced under the name, uh, Gary Gilbert. And so I did a search for that name and that didn't turn up anything. And, and so one of the reasons why I didn't immediately publish everything or release everything from that first interview was I didn't want to come out and just flat out call him a bold faced liar. Hmm. I wanted to, I wanted to honestly and truly do my due diligence to, to prove or disprove the things that he had said and give him the benefit of the doubt because the fact of the matter is I like Larry Wright. He is a good, he's a good guy. He's funny. He is quick with a quip. Uh, I mean, the interview that's going to post today, he said that, um, he said something about, uh, one of the people who was involved in, uh, um, in the Talladega deal. And, and he ended the quote by saying, you don't pee in a fan. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it, that's just one of the country kind of, you know, backwoods things that he would say, but it makes you like him. It makes you trust him. And then things happen. And that's how he gets you. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, so in it, I know you wrote about like Darlington. So did you ever find out, like, did he ever attempt to race at Darlington, for example? Uh, or that is I that was still able, unknown? I don't know. That is able, uh, as far as I was able to determine, nobody under any of his known aliases ever raced in either Winston Cup or ARCA, uh, which is the 
the other division that he claims to have driven in. Now, if he if he somehow ran under another name, I have not been able to determine that. Yeah. But you know, if if you go through all the known aliases and you go through his story that tends to change back and forth, you you know what yeah. to think. Yeah. Well, I, to echo what Rick is saying, I understand after reading all this material and listening to Rick, the kind of person LW can be when it comes to being quick with a quip or a story or something like that. But once you read it through both parts of Rick's story, you come to realize that a guy this smooth and this quick for one of a better phrase, makes a pretty good con man. I mean, let's face it. And I'm not calling names or anything, but the traits that make this type of individual pretty good when it comes to, oh, getting on the other side of the law very smoothly, those traits are very obvious in LW. Yeah, I mean, we began this conversation here talking about him getting arrested for allegedly many of the things we just talked about. In any of your conversations with him, Rick, did you get the impression that maybe like, you know, conning your way into a NASCAR and national race at Talladega is uh, kind of top of the bucket list, I guess. But um, do you get the impression that maybe there's even maybe he he's done something else besides just NASCAR that uh, maybe that's a story that surfaces one day? Well, in the story that's coming out, um, he he kind of talks about why he wound up at Talladega. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Catch Me If You Can about Frank Abagnale or what, whatever his last name is, uh, Abagnale. Um, but he gives Larry gives me that kind of impression that he needed to go to Talladega in order to satisfy some kind of itch and and then go from there he also says that he went to talladega at least in part to satisfy some trouble that he was in with the fbi <laughs> how, how does how, how does that happen are you gonna hide from the fbi in plain sight i <laughs> yes sir yes that's sir incredible. that's incredible yeah uh, you've talked yeah. about he has a number of known aliases uh, how many different fake names have you been able to to uncover of his on on the record uh on on the uh arrest uh on the the information i saw on the website um there's frank well there's um larry Wright. there's larry smith i think it was and ernest somebody else and then I actually got a phone call recently uh, in the last couple of weeks from a hotel in Nashville, Tennessee, from an Ern- uh, and they said that an Ernest Tuccio had left their cell phone behind, and my name was the only one to contact. And the only person that it could have been was Larry. And so, yeah, there's, there's at least, I think there's at least four or five different that, that he has used over the years. Wow. Uh, that's fascinating. That's, I wonder how many, <laughs> sounds almost like he kind of knew what he was doing. Multiple phones, uh, you know, kind of leave them behind. I mean, that's, yeah, that, that's crazy. In, in, in the well, that's time. That's a good thing he said there. It, it's exactly the way I feel. I feel <laughs> he knew exactly what he was doing all of this time. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Well, no, I don't think he used five different phones by accident. Uh, but I will, I will say this. I, I, Larry paint comes across as uh very paranoid or very concerned about being caught. He also at the very same time comes across as somebody with a thirst for excitement and danger and walking on the wild side. And so when those two different sides of his nature collide, that the the current situation i think is what happens and again the the larry wright that i know i like but i also know that there's another side to larry and you know larry and i and my wife actually went to lunch one day 
at, at a at a uh, restaurant in uh well we went to lunch at a restaurant <laughs> 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 gotta be careful gotta be careful uh but we went to lunch one day and my wife liked him now my wife is also uh, a retired district court judge and so she you know she liked him but mm. but <laughs> um and, and so i honestly i want to see i want to see the best happen for larry uh i, I don't want to see him get off the hook uh i don't want to see him go free without uh paying his his debt to society uh but i like him I, yeah. I, the fact of the matter is i like him I wonder uh, then. I mean, what is next? Because I mean, he's been arrested. I, I don't know that. I don't know the details. I'm not sure how many details uh, you know. I'm sure you know more than I do. But what do you think is next in the L.W. Wright story? Or do you think this is virtually where it kind of winds to an end? With everything that he is charged with, and the the charges in Jefferson County, Tennessee, are not just what exists right now, from what I understand. I know for a fact that he is also wanted uh, in Granger County, Tennessee, uh, for some charges that are pretty substantial. And from what I understand, what I've able, been able to to dig up uh, and, and find out is the fact that he's also wanted in Virginia and um, I think Alabama yeah. on, on different things. So um, if and when he is convicted of all these things, I, I don't know what the what the penalty is. Uh, but he, uh, Larry is, uh, elderly. He is 70, four years old, 74, 75, somewhere in there. And so even a matter of, you know, four or five years is going to put him even further into, uh, old age. Uh, wow. and, and, you know, that for me, that saddens me, that saddens me for the Larry that I know. But at the same side, but by the same token, and the way that I describe it in the story is that there are two Larry Wrights. There's Larry Wright, who's the good guy, but there's also L.W. Wright, the the con artist. Right. So you know that makes me that makes me hurt for Larry, but L.W. Yeah, he 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 needs to pay the price. If he is in fact guilty, let me throw that in there. <laughs> of course, alleged. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll be really curious to see what comes next if there is something that comes next uh, in the L.W. Wright story. Um, but uh, gentlemen, this has been fascinating for me to listen to. I, I am excited to read part two uh, of your story and to see what else comes. When was the last time uh, you might have mentioned it in the first part? I forget, Rick. But when was the last time you got to talk to Larry? <clears throat> well <laughs> is that a spoiler oh no uh no it's not a spoiler <laughs> but i actually did talk to him a couple of days ago while he was in jail i wondered you, were you his one phone yeah. call no <laughs> 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 you watch too many movies <laughs> <laughs> no i was i was on the phone with a source and Larry happened to ring in and they put me on the line with a three-way call with Larry. Wow. So, uh, yeah, I got to talk to him. He, he seemed very tired. He, he, he was not the upbeat, uh, gregarious Larry, Wright That I know. Um, and, and I, I do think that Larry understands the, what he's up against right now. Sure. As yeah. you know, Eric, there's one other thing. We've talked about L.W. Wright being a, sort of a legend like D.B. Cooper. Mm -hmm. I think you'd be surprised at how many fans, listeners, have responded to us by saying, why didn't you just leave it alone? Really, why mm -hmm. didn't you let the legend of L.W. Wright just stand like D.B. Cooper's has? Well, to be honest with you, that might have been okay, but when you run into an enterprising journalist like Rick, and he makes his efforts to go and find L.W. Wright, and he does, and not only does he get L.W.'s story, he learns much about the man that we don't know. We never do, and he's revealed all that. 
And he's also revealed the side of the story that L.W. Wright is not really a bad guy when you're one-on-one -on -one with him as a person. Now, for his professions, that's another matter. And you can't really separate the person from what he's done. If he's done anything, allegedly, he will have to pay for it. That's true. But it, this, is, this is why we're talking about him today. It's because we ignored the legend. Rather, Rick ignored the legend and went after the facts. Well, you know, Eric, it's not in a reporter's nature to just leave it alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the very moment that I first started getting involved in NASCAR, getting interested in NASCAR, the legend of L.W. Wright is one of the, the first legends or myths or whatever you want to call it that you that you learn about. And so as a reporter, you want that story. But, you know, how are you ever going to get something like that? And just right. one day, literally just by chance, it fell into my lap. And uh, I was – I felt obligated to chase it. So oh. that's what I did. And so far, it's turned out to be – like I said earlier, the craziest story I've ever been a part of, bar none, period, without a doubt. Yeah, and that's an interesting argument, leaving the legend alone. But I know I, for one, and I think I can speak for many fans, that uh, I prefer to operate uh, in a world with more information. Like, I want to know yeah. the facts. I want to be able to make my own judgments on the real characters, the real people involved. So uh, I've enjoyed following this story uh, the last year or ever since that first interview, the first uh, podcast dropped. Uh, and I, I, I honestly, I'm looking forward to part two tomorrow. And I'm curious to see if this does have another chapter in the future. But um, I guess maybe to start wrapping things up, uh, what do you want fans listening ultimately to take away from uh, L.W. Wright's story? Like, like what is what conclusions, I guess, do you hope or do you maybe expect fans to draw? The legend of L.W. Wright is fantastic. He, he, he drove Talladega. Nobody knew him, and he made off with $44,000 in, in equipment and cash. It, it, this, what we have been able to discover about L.W. Wright and Larry Wright, this is one of those rare cases where the, the side of the story, the truth, if you, if you will, is doesn't even i mean the, the myth doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of what actually happened yeah and, and so truth in this case is really stranger than fiction that's that's what i think that uh people should know Steve, do you have any thoughts cuz you've had to listen to Rick uh to talk about this i'm sure nonstop <laughs> no well i all through this, I've just been a spear carrier. But to be very honest with you, Rick pretty much touched on what I think listeners and viewers should take away from the entire story. We've all heard the legend, okay? The legend is not necessarily the truth. And let's face it, we've all heard the mystery as well. Well, thanks to Rick Houston, now we know the truth. And the truth may be stranger than fiction, but it's always the better of the two. Absolutely. Well, uh, gentlemen, I really appreciate you guys having me on to, to hear some of these stories firsthand. Uh, and I'm looking forward to whatever comes next in the L.W. Wright story, if there is another chapter in it. Um, but I really appreciate y'all having me on. Thank you, Eric. Very, we thank enjoyed you, it. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching. Again, if you want the full story, all the additional context, be sure to check out Rick Houston's two-part story. I will link them down in the description below. I'm looking forward to hopefully collaborating with the Scene Vault podcast on other projects in the future. I've got some exciting things to announce here in the next week or so. But thank you for watching this video. Thank you again to Rick Houston and Steve Wade for their time and for sharing some of their findings on the show. Hope you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.